Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us right now on iTunes, please go and leave a five-star review. Go on, go on, go on and do it. What have you got to lose? Just say whatever you feel. This is a really great review from Beer Makes Me Drunk. Um, the subject of their <laughs> review is great show. This is an eclectic, interesting, and provocative show. I love the way Chrissy speaks to people from all over the spectrum and talks to them seriously. Even if you think the guest is crazy, <laughs> listen to the Flat Earth guy. It is refreshing to hear a wide range of opinions and views on current events without sycophantic... I said that right. Sycophantic descent, but rather with an open mind and curiosity, a truly interesting and fun listen. Keep up the good work. Wow. This might even be my new favorite review. Thank you so much. Beer makes me drunk. Um, very excited to announce. I have a lot of dates coming up. Uh, Saturday, uh, February 6th, I'm going to be at Cost Cobb Comedy. Uh, I'm all my Texas people, I'm finally coming out to you. I'm going to be in Dallas at uh, Hyenas on February 19th and 20th. So get your tickets for that right now. And then on February 26th, I'm going to be performing with the Comedians of the Compound at the Soul Joel's Comedy Club in Royersford, PA. And then on Sunday, February 28th, I'm going to be performing at the Stress Factory in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And then I'm also very, very excited to announce I will be touring with my friend Tim Young. We are getting some dates together right now. Uh, very exciting. We have some dates coming together for late April and May uh, out in Florida. And then we're going to be heading up to Zanies in Nashville, Huntsville, Alabama. I think we just booked a date out in Cleveland. So this is a very, very exciting. Um Tim Young is, is super funny, and if you don't follow him on Twitter, he's a great follow on Twitter, so I highly, highly recommend that as well. Of course, me too. I'm a great follow, but Tim Young is a great follow too. Uh, this episode is brought to you by the one and only One Soul, One Soul Shoes. I am so excited to announce that they are uh, our new sponsor for the show, One Soul is the original interchangeable soul. It began uh, in 2001. It's basically an interchangeable soul that you can change with hundreds of different tops, and they snap on and off in seconds. It's known for its comfort, and it's the perfect shoe for traveling because you only need one soul and a handful of tops. There are hundreds of different tops available, but One Soul is known for the comfy neoprene top that fits your foot like a glove. You can even customize the top with any photo or logo you want. Uh, this product was featured on ABC News as best product made in America and was a season finale winner on Shark Tank. Uh, it is sold throughout the world and was created by a pharmacist by the name of Dominique McLean Bartit. And if you go to onesoulshoe.com and use the promo code CMP, you're going to get 25% off your whole order. These are really, really great. And it's not just the one, you know, black sole there that you see like this one is like a wedge it's very very cute this one is a heel um this is like a black like funky wedge and it's like very very i love that they sent me like the one trial like trump <laughs> thing but it just comes like on and off it's very very easy again like this is so great literally this makes me want to go somewhere because this totally solves the problem of like when you're a chick and your the shoes take up so much space in your damn luggage, but this is really solves that, which is like, where was this years ago? Um, so go to onesoulshoe.com, use the promo code CMP, get 25% off your entire order. You guys know the deal. Um, I'm very, very excited to have this guy on the podcast today. He is a headlining comedian. He is also the owner of the Stress Factory Comedy Clubs in New Brunswick, New Jersey and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Vinny Brand, how are you, buddy? Oh my God, Chris Mayer, thanks for having me. And, oh my uh, God. and what a nice introduction! Especially you deserve after, it after the mess that I made you wait and wait and wait, and I apologize. Oh, you're worth the wait, Vinny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you are. You're listen. I gotta say, to front says you're blowing up, and uh, and you're everywhere, and you're and I'm excited to be on. So 
Ooh, thank you. And now you. I'm gonna wear one soles, which I never thought I would wear. This, I like, I mean, this is perfect. There's the type of lady that would be so thrilled for this. I feel like everybody's mom needs to have this because <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. They're, I'm I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, it's, they're a little cold. It's a little too cold to wear these outside right now. But um, oh boy, come spring, you're not gonna be able to stop me in these one soles right here. <laughs> Six weeks out, Chrissy. Six weeks out. <laughs> spring is here. I know. I would like put it on and show everybody, but then this becomes a uh, very quickly a foot fetish podcast. So I'm trying to uh, <laughs> keep it keep it professional here. Um, I want to know, Vinny. Like, wh when did you st for the people who don't know you? When did you start comedy? Um, what inspired you to get into the producing of comedy? Because I know that oftentimes, because uh, I produced a comedy show. I've always, I feel like I've always been producing something. I've only been doing it like about 10 years. Um, but I produced a show for six years at the Stonewall Inn. And uh, I, for a while, kind of got some flack. I got some shit from people like, oh, you're only producing, you know, this show because you want the stage time. And I just am wondering, um, did you at any point get any flack for being both a uh, performing comic, headlining comic, and also producing? Yes. And and I'm going to tell you right now, it's just recently that I've decided to call bullshit on all those people because the people that give you flack for being on multiple sides of the industry are the same people. Some of them are now producing and getting into and understanding the other aspect of it. And let's face facts. I mean, if you wanted to be a movie star, and you wrote a play, I don't know, call it A Bronx Tale. And say you're a <laughs> you know, child of or, or Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who I guess they wrote, produced, whatever, um, whatever movie, that, Dead Poets Society, whatever it was. So I got shit for a long time. And then only just recently, and when I said recently, it's, it is really recently that I just started saying, you know what? I don't care anymore because I love stand-up comedy. I love all aspects of it. And I probably have invested more than the next 20 guys hmm. because I, I did the city thing. I did it every night. I, I did the grind. I did the road. I opened the club and you know, I was all in at all times. Now, the guys that were, uh, that give you shit or, or, or look down their nose and say, well, why are you producing? And I, I don't have time for them anymore. Like, I don't care. Um, I, I, it's a very difficult thing because every artist wants to be accepted, right? Whether you're a musician, a comedian, actor, whatever you are. But... I can't think of any other genre, genre that is so instantly judged and made aware of what the jury decided. So, you know, you do a play and people will basically sit politely through the play, get in the car and go, oh, that thing was terrible. You go to a concert, they go home and go, ah, yeah, not for me. But in a comedy club, they're not laughing or they are. And they'll walk out. There's, there's almost no other medium that allows the audience and the ultimate arbitrator of whether you're good or not to weigh in the way they do in comedy. It's instant. And they don't have to heckle you. <clears throat> they don't have to walk out. They can just sit there quietly and do this. <laughs> oh yeah, that cuts through you like a knife. You're like, ooh. Now, now the reason I say all that is, so we are instantly more aware of whether we're accepted or not. So when your peer group is giving you flack for producing, that's another level of garbage that producers deal with. And I, susp I suspect that there are producers that aren't funny. And I suspect there are producers that are very funny. I'm very confident in what I do. So 
I, you know, I no longer worry about whether comic A or B or whatever disapproves of what I've done. But yeah, I caught a lot of flack for a long time. And my journey into producing was driven by a desire to have more stage time. So, you know, I'll give you a short version of a long story. I started doing open mic uh, on a, I was in, I owned a construction company and a flower shop. I had three little kids. I was in a difficult and actively failing marriage. And I did stand up one night at Rascals in Eatontown. And at that time, I'm going to say it was 1989. Comedy was in a boom, and I'd watch Comic Strip Live with John Mulroney, and I'd watch Evening at the Improv, a Bud Freeman show, and uh, there was a million shows on. And, you know, not understanding how cleaned up comedy had to be for television, I'd sit there and go, these guys, some of them are good, but some of them are, ugh. You know, it's a young, uh, cocky perspective. Mm-hmm. And I did open mic the very first time. And Chrissy, I didn't prepare. I didn't prepare. And that first night on stage, I killed. Killed. Wow. Like, <laughs> and, well, yeah, but no, the story gets fun. So I killed. <laughs> and, I, and in my head, I thought, well, I'm going to be a star overnight. So I had not prepared. So the very next week, I get another time. And all week long, I wrote. Because I'm so sure that if I didn't prepare and got laughs, if I prepare. Oh, well, you'll blow them away. Yeah. But, you know, they'll be in the back of the room on the phone with, you know, Letterman going, you got to get here right now. So <laughs> I prepared and I, the week, I, I'll tell you, it's a fun story. We have a little time, right? Oh, yeah. All right. So <laughs> the week that I killed, I watched other comics go up and get very nervous and sweaty and, I, I remember thinking these guys are so nervous and stuff tight. And I laughed because I'm driving home going, I'm better than all these guys. I'm already instantly better. So that week I wrote a bit and the bit was that these other comics were so bad and nerve, nervous, not bad. And I was going to kill for three minutes. And then I wrote these, these jokes that centered on me sweating and wetting my pants. And I was going to be referencing how nervous, these other guys were. And what I did uh, is I took fish tube that feeds a fish tank and I hooked it up to two balls of water and I hid that underneath my shirt and these balls of water would deliver to my armpit. And I was going to be talking about how guys were sweating so <laughs> profusely. Wow, so and you were a prop comic right away. I, well, well, only for one set. <laughs> and uh, and and. Then I'm going to talk about how some of them are so nervous. They're wetting their pants. I have another tube set up to deliver a urine stain to my crotch on stage. Did and you this, bring extra pants and underpants, or you didn't think that far ahead to change out of them? Th- I did not think that far ahead. I, <laughs> I, I, all I knew is that this shit was brilliant. So I'm on stage doing my jokes that I had written, and they're bombing horribly. And now this is a very different experience. It's one week later and I'm tanking. And I remember even to this day thinking, okay, it doesn't matter. Because when you get to the sweat stains under your armpits, that's going to be every back. And then yeah. when I do the urine, the house is coming down. Mm. Coming down. Yeah. So I'm on stage, I'm bombing. And I, and I start saying, oh, those guys last week are so nervous. Yes, it was almost like you could see them sweating right away through their armpits. And I hit the tube. And I feel the water go right down my side. And I look and my armpits are dry as a bone. And I'm going, I'm sweating now. Look at my armpits. And there's no stain. There's nothing. The people are on stage. They're going to be just like you are right now. Like, It just didn't it? work? Well, the water came out, but my shirt was too loose. It just ran down my ribs. Oh, no. And then when I hit the khaki, the second water tube to make my pants wet, that also just ran down my leg into my socks. Uh, and I'm on stage going, I think I wet my pants. And I'm telling you, people in the audience are looking at me like, what the f- is this guy talking about? And so all of a sudden, the lights and sound went off at the same time. Everything went off. 
And I said, oh, thank God, there's a power failure. Uh -huh. That's how, right? And I look back in the back of the room and there's Ward Magnuson going, get the fuck off stage. And so oh, that was no. my second time. Now, I walked off, I'm gonna quit. Paul Veneer said, no, don't quit. Last week was the abnormality. You're supposed to bomb. Stay with it. And that began my process of doing open mic. But I instinctively knew that doing one open mic a week, I wouldn't get better quick enough. So I sought out a place to do another open mic far away from Rascals. And was this Rascals in New Jersey? It was Rascals. This one was Eatontown. Um, okay. So I found a place to do open mic in New Brunswick. And it, uh, it was a closed, it was a bar that had nothing on Sunday night. And so that open mic was a $5 open mic. And it was for Rutgers students. No one had a car. When Rascals got word of that, they blackballed me. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, blackballed me. And so they blackballed me. And about a year and a half later, an opportunity came to open a full-time club. And I said, well, they blackballed me saying I was competition. I might as well be competition. And I opened yeah, up. Yeah, you stuck yeah. it to them. Well, I, I, you know, I wanted to do stand-up. I was blackballed in New York. I was blackballed in New Jersey for running this wow. city open mic. And, um, and I loved doing stand-up. So when I opened the club, it was me saying I need somewhere to be on stage. Uh, subsequent to that, <clears throat> maybe 1994, five, maybe earlier, I get passed at the comic strip and then the cellar and stand up New York and all of those rooms I'm working. And now I'm a guy that owns a comedy club that's doing comedy and I'm proficient, but, uh, Still getting shit from guys because anyone that I wouldn't use automatically hated me, hmm. and then even guys I would use, yeah, they're influenced by their peer group. So now there were guys that always encouraged me, David Tell, always from day one. Such a good hey, guy. Such a good guy. You're funny. Keep doing it. Um, you know, uh, guys that I knew early on that encouraged me to keep going guys from the New York comedy scene. I mean, even guys like Ray Romano, who made a little splash, used to say, hey, you're really good. Keep going, keep going. So there was a cohort of guys that supported me and there was a lot of guys that, that didn't like it. But that's mm -hmm. how I got into doing it. It wasn't, I didn't do it um, just to get stage time. I did it because there was this move by rascals that they made. And I'm like, yeah, I, just, I don't like being cornered anyway. So it's horrible. It's a lot of times in comedy, you get blackballed for the, the smallest thing. And it's like, not to sound like such a victim, but, but I know exactly how that feels because I was like blackballed and banned by the Creek in the cave because of the, because the, I was dating somebody that the owner wanted to date. And I had no idea. They were like kind of hooking up the summer before he and I met. And it wasn't until she was like flipping out saying, I never want to see her again. That I was like, what, what? And I still to this day don't understand like w why she was so upset. I had tried reaching out, sending emails. Uh, and it, it really was like devastating. Cause I was like, I didn't do anything to this person. Like I support comedy. I had even donated like over a hundred dollars or something like w when she had like a fundraiser to like fix the theater or something. So, and that's like, especially if you're a newer comic, like that feeling of being banned from a place is like, oh, what do you do? Like, do you defend yourself? Do you just suck it up and find other rooms? And I, and I kind of like sucked it up and found other rooms, but, um, it's, it's a, it's a pretty horrible thing that happens and it can, it's enough to, you know, make some people quit entirely. It's, it is a, and I don't want to sound like we're suffering, right? I mean, we're right. a stand up comic, but think about it. <clears throat> it's competitive as hell. The notion of all these comics in a room pulling for each other couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, there are guys that do pull, but there's a lot of competition. Uh, and then you have to please various bookers 
and the audience and the owners. And by the time you're done kissing everybody's ass, hmm. you're like, uh, it's a brutal thing, right? So, you know, uh, I love it. Uh, and there was a little more, I think, a little more camaraderie back then than there is now. Hmm. Wait, you uh, mean before social media or like before, like if you could pinpoint the this like area, the sweet spot of time? Was it like the early aughts? Was it more the 90s? I think, I think at the comic strip, there was a... I always found the comic strip, from my personal experience, warmer as a hangout amongst the comics than the seller. The seller was sitting at that table and you had to be on and sharp. Even and just in your banter, even when you were off stage, you know, I, just I still sitting telling, there. I, I remember telling uh, guys more than a couple of times, do you have, can't we just talk? Like, <laughs> do we have to be shut up stupid? Do we have to say shut up stupid every day? And I liked the center a lot. There was good vibe at the center. But I felt the strip was warmer. The comic strip, when the booth was there and Lucian was there, passing at the strip was an event. Getting past there was an event. And then, you know, I was hanging out. It was Tom Cotter, Ross Bennett. Um, wow, yeah. I'm trying to think of all, all the whole list. Eric Tom Cotter is so funny and also another really nice guy. Tom Cotter is, he's a machine on stage. Machine. Yeah. <laughs> Super nice guy. A genuine guy. So the comics were back then, Matteries, Cotter, me, McMahon, Florentine, uh, Norton for a while until he got his show. Uh, Lisa Lampanelli. Uh, Ray would come in and out, but once he got the show, he was on at the Greener Pastures. Um, the, the common MCs were Jim Mandrinos, the ex uh You would hang out with Bill McCarty with, uh, he just passed away. Um, oh, God. Oh, um, don't tell me. Oh, man. Was he the one who was like... Um... Vic, Vic Henley. Oh, Vic. Oh, my God. Another really sweetheart guy. Vic Henley, Jerry Red Wilson. Uh, it was just a great group. And, you know, we would all go eat bagels afterward or all go eat Chinese food later. <laughs> the salary you hung at that table and it was a good vibe, but it was definitely a clicky vibe. Hmm. Now, I, you know, I was in the click, but boy, there was a click at the salary. The there was a click within a click. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, I was in the click, but if it was the wrong guys there, I was on the outside going, whatever you do. <laughs> don't order the, you know, whatever. I mean, so the, the, the center had that you're here and you fit in and we're good, but there's this click and then there's this better click. And so, I mean, I, I like the center, but I like the, the strip was warmer. I can understand that. Cause I've, uh, I'm not past at the cellar yet, but I've heard from comics like who, who are, who were, were like, there is this tension there because to me it feels like the the comics feel like, Oh, you're just, you're like a bad set away from being unpassed. Like you almost like there's this fear to try out new material because you just can't ever have a bad set because someone's always watching and you can't, you know, you have to deliver every single time a hundred percent. And, and that's really, that is true. I think that was true. And that's really the death of, creativity anyway that's the death of creativity to me you know if you're not willing to go up and take a chance and write some new stuff and be creative what are we doing here i mean yeah you're in the set in the city you're working for a 35 dollar check at one point it was a 15 dollar check i think when i passed at the at the strip it was a 10 dollar check so it used to cost me you know 38 dollars to get in to make 10 and you know you uh, go around and get enough set to, to cover your night. But yeah, there was that, that, uh, and for a while, okay, maybe so-and-so from club was uh, from every TV show was there. 
and you might end up on Letterman. But that kind of passed quickly. Uh, so, you know, to me, I never understood, and I try very hard to be welcoming to comics. I'm sure I've had my moments. Guys have rubbed me the wrong way. I try and get over it. Uh, but I think I have a better, uh, I think I have a better reputation for being welcoming than I ever had for not being welcome, I think. Yeah, and I think it's it's even more of a challenge because not only do you have to get along with people as a comic because these are your coworkers, you see these guys all the time or girls all the time, m multiple times a week, but as a comedy club owner, it's like the additional pressure to like be welcoming in a totally different way and you sometimes have to deal with comics who like have weird demands or like you don't know until you are in that comedy club booker position and you're like wow so and so is actually kind of a diva like wow and uh because i have you know you hear stories over the years you know i heard from this one like a couple comedy club people you know you hear like they were saying like, oh this one comic like mike epps is like he 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 rolls with this huge entourage and and he, you know, hassles this the staff. Everyone's there's everyone's ordering food, and like you hear these stories about comics who take advantage of what are supposed to be like the nice things that the club offers to make you feel good. Um, have you? What are your experiences with that? Or can you think of any like crazy, um, like moments or memories or asks of, of comics well, that just blew you away? Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you two stories. Uh, Damon Wayans was booked in the club the very first time he ever came in. And the writer <laughs> was just, I mean, outside of the norm. Uh, you, know, you need a cot in the green room with blankets and pillows and yada, 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 and this food and that food and all that stuff. And man, I don't know Damon Wayans and I'm busting my ass to get everything. And I don't know the guy, I've never met him. A cot, and, it's like. But he, he's Damon Wayans for God's sake. And so we get everything. We die, and our room is not big in New Brunswick. Bridgeport's amazing, but we get, I get there that night and I'm just, I'm, I'm so nervous. And I get there and I walk in, I go, hey, Damon, I'm Benny Brand. He goes, hey, man, it's really nice to meet you. He goes, hey, man, he goes, this cot. And I'm like, in my head, I go, are you effing kidding me? This guy's gonna have a problem with a cot that I went out and bought. <laughs> And I, he You're goes, like, it's here. You have a cot. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny. He goes, man, he goes, I feel terrible. He goes, you don't have to do that. He goes, they sent you the rider for my concert when I'm doing a, a concert. He goes, oh, Vinny, he goes, you don't have to do any of this stuff. He goes, I, just get me. And, it's, and then he's like, just get me some organic fruit or whatever it was. It was so simple. The nicest guy in the world to deal with. And then I've worked with every one of the way in, and I will tell you that I can't tell you who's nicer. Keenan, who is the genesis, and Damon, who's the genesis, down to Sean and Marlon, uh, Damon Jr., Damon Sr. It's like a nice family factory. Like, I would wow. like, oh, Chrissy, I've told a couple of them, I would like to meet your parents. Yeah, figure out what they're doing. <laughs> I, well, I want to just say to them, you, you did it right. Uh, Mrs. Wayne just passed away not long ago, uh, and I never met them. But the whole family, just a doll. Now, the other extreme, Eddie Griffin, who is, you know, he had a, a big blow up at my club a couple a year ago now. But Eddie wants you to buy a set of sneakers for every show. So if you have a book for six shows, Six sets of sneakers. And they're sneakers? You know, what? Sneakers. sneakers. What kind of sneakers? Um uh, Jordans, Nike Jordans, and all, you know, it was always a specific demand. Wow. And the very first time he ever came in, and I don't mind telling the story because I'll never book Eddie Griffin ever again. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I never will. He, you know, he did a bad thing to us at the club. Uh and someday maybe he'll call me and apologize. I doubt that seriously. Uh, but if he does, great. But the thing that I did, and I look at the sneakers are $230. Damn. I'm not buying 
four ten dollars worth of sneakers for a weekend. I don't so, even ask that of my boyfriend. I'd be like, <laughs> Chrissy, this is such an evil thing that I did. He came in, where are my sneakers? I go, oh man, Eddie. I went all over the track. I said, area. no one had your size. <laughs> what Ed, size was he? Like a regular size? He's like a size six and a half. Oh, that's small. <laughs> yeah, I'm, actually, I don't remember. I'm just oh. saying that because <laughs> that would mean, you know, he's small. But, uh, he's small on the pants. Yep. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yep. So, but whatever it was, and I just said, I didn't have your size. And he was a little bit upset. But then he worked with us for years. And I, he would never remember. And I would do the same thing every time. Ah, I didn't have your size. I'm sorry. I was everywhere. You're such a popular size. And he would just accept it and move on. And that was about the craziest. Uh, most of the guys, riders, are not too bad. There are guys that do what you said, though. They come in 12 people. I want, give everybody menus. Give, Give them a drink. Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that gets old. Uh, that, there aren't too many bad guys. They're mostly good guys. But it happens. It does happen. I, I, lost, I lost my train there. We were having um, so much fun. <laughs> I wanted to know. I wanted, I'm curious to know if, if, like, what happened with Eddie was, was something with someone on the staff. Or did he just, like, bomb a set or no. rude to you? He was in he was in Bridgeport one week, New Brunswick the very next pardon me, the very next week. And it, Bridgeport shows went fine. Uh, he was very arrogant the first night, and I was there the first night. And he had security guys. And he says, I, I walk in the green room, hey, hey Eddie, how you doing? I'm Vinny. That is a guy I've known for yeah, you know, twelve years, fifteen years, whatever. It's been a long time. And uh, his security guy, you can see his security guys getting upset. And I go, yeah, I'm Vinny, whatever. And the security guy goes, hey, just so you know, no girl servers are allowed to talk to Eddie. And I'm like, okay. And in my head, I thought to myself, well, something happened somewhere because I don't have that rule. There's no, yeah, that's any, a, any brand has no rule, right? It's an odd rule. It's, well, that's the rule that, in my opinion, came about because somebody said something somewhere. So then, then the security guy, I got right, Eddie, you know, the security guy goes, um, when anyone talks to Eddie, they'll talk to me and then I'll relay it to Eddie and the conversation goes through me. Now I'm sitting there, so Eddie's three feet this way. And the security guy's three feet that way. They're, we're all in one little triangle. And I go, uh, okay, is somebody talking? Is somebody approached Eddie? I mean, I, no one's been in the green room. That I know. And the guy goes, well, you know, you're talking to Eddie right now. I go, so you want me to come in and go, tell Eddie I said hi. And then you're going to look at Eddie and say, Vinny said hi. And Eddie's going to say, tell Vinny I said hi. And you're going to back at me and you're going to say, Eddie said hi. And he goes, everything has to go through me. I go, I'm not doing that. I'm not That's doing insane. That. That's an insane rule. <laughs> it's, a, it's a ridiculous request. Then a couple of things happen. And now I go into the green room. It's later on. And the guy goes, uh, when the guy, when the waiter, waiter only brings the food into the green room, he has to knock. And then I'll admit him, even if we know the food's coming. Then I've had it. And I go, you know what? Eddie's sitting right there. I go, Eddie is one of the most important comics in the country. And I don't want anybody to take him off his creative role. So when you want food, you go out and you tell the waiter what, you want, what he wants. And the waiter will bring it to you outside the room. And you can bring it to Eddie. He goes, that's not necessary. <laughs> yeah, I go, he goes, that's not necessary. I said, yes, it is. I'm not having my waiter come in here because it's a problem. Now. Really? That's a really good way to handle it. What's that? That was a good way to handle it. Well, the rest of the weekend, I sent Derek up there and I didn't go up. And Derek is really good with people. And Derek says, listen, I got to all calm down. It's all good. He comes to New Brunswick the next week. Eddie wants the music cranked up super loud. 
and he wants it overdriven. Well, I've been in business for 30 years. I have never blown an amplifier. The feature, the opening act goes up. Uh, African American, which is important, does his job. Eddie's now getting introduced, and the guy's going louder, 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 louder. And when he did it so loud, it blew a fuse. And now the sound goes down. Okay. And Eddie storms off stage at the end of that first show and says, fuck this place, I ain't coming back. Now they call me, and I, I'm on the phone with his manager. I'm going, hey, this can't happen this way, blah, 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 blah. And we get him back for the second show. And I tell my manager, do not crank that music. Well, the road manager's going, I don't give a fuck. He ain't going on stage. Crank it, crank it. Derek says, okay, I'll crank it for five seconds. He cranked it, blows the fuse. He can't get it reset for 10 minutes. Eddie goes on stage and says, fuck Vinny Brand. He's a racist. This motherfucker doesn't like black people. Everybody leave right now. Don't pay your fucking checks. Wow. It goes viral. Everybody walks out. Eddie walks off. I call the manager, a whole brouhaha breaks out. Derek calls an electrician at, at one o'clock in the morning. He comes in at 8 a.m., rewires everything. We secure everything. Eddie will not work Saturday night. So we had, you know, this is before COVID, we have 1,400 tickets sold and no artists. So what we did is we gave everybody free tickets for a show and we got a uh, talent, and um, I forget who else. I should know that. But they came into the show and people had a great time. But that's, you know, that's a level of, you know, calling me racist on stage is, and people that know me, they know I am not a racist. Um, I don't have time to hate anybody. I it also no sucks that you have to go out of your way to say that you're not a racist. Like, that's what actually, like, it, it just seems like such a, I don't know. It's, it sucks that that's the time that we're living in, that you actually have to, like, anyone who's met you or worked with you can tell that. It's like, you shouldn't even have to say, like, everyone, I'm not racist. And uh, it sucks. It's just like, yeah, don't blow out my amplifiers. <laughs> don't blow out the speakers. Someone called me racist um, not long ago. And it said, no, I said something I said I never said. But I wouldn't react. And what I said is, my body of work speaks for itself. You believe whatever you want to believe. I don't control your emotions. I don't control your thought process. People that know me, they know the work I've done in charity. They know the work I've done <clears throat> helping young comics. They know the work I've done in my community. And they know that I have helped every manner of human being. And so, you know, my rule is say what you want. Believe what you want. You want to believe the words of somebody that doesn't know me? That's your prerogative. But my body of work speaks for itself. As a human, as a producer, as a comic. Um, and I also say that as a society, as an individual, we always want to get better. So there's, I will never say that I never made a mistake, a misogynist joke, whatever, that I wouldn't do today. But the goal of my life is to always get better. So if I was late tonight on your podcast and it bothers me, I know that in my head I go, okay, tomorrow you got to do better. You can't make another human being wait an hour and 15 minutes. Was it that long? I don't know. I always run, I run late too, but. See, I'm Why already you? letting you off the hook. <laughs> I was very, very annoyed at you for potentially running late when I was already running late. <laughs> I am so mad that maybe I would have been on time and you would have been late, goddammit. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's a very difficult culture right now mm -hmm. for comics because you got to walk that tightrope. And I say that unless you're a hate-filled individual, unless your material is rooted in hate, then the jokes are the jokes, right? They land or they don't. It's like not a big deal. Yeah. So you're a woman um, for now. For and, now. Uh, for now. 
And I did a joke <laughs> on stage. And it's a true story. I was sitting around a bunch of my daughter's friends. <clears throat> and I said, hey, you guys feel like pizza. I'm going to order pizza for them. And one of them said, uh, we're not guys. And I jokingly said, bitch, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> uh, now, it was just a joke. Now, that girl, to her great credit, laughed. I did the joke on stage, and a woman in the audience got mad at the joke, at the true story, and the person I said it to didn't get upset. Now, mm. you know, where do you draw your lines? I mean, that's that's our culture right now. It's like the the people, like for example, if you'll you'll use the example of um, like I noticed like a lot of like white girls get upset for black people, but like an actual black person wouldn't be upset at that particular joke or whatever it is. It's like, you have this, like we have people who are saviors for other people that like don't need your saving and don't need your being offended. So I hope that like, I feel like that trend is on its way out. I think people are sick of it and sick and sick of folks who are like so easily offended. And, uh, I just can't stop thinking about that guy. I, I feel like th there's nothing more selfish than like, what was there? She said 1400 fans in the room and he wouldn't do that blows my mind. Like that's the peak of selfishness. Like I, I can't imagine ever getting so famous or like so rich that I could do that to my fans. Um, it's it's just I, not it's not worth sticking it to one person to screw over. Like you wouldn't be there without your fans. Like they love you. Like it's, I don't know. That makes me so angry because I think there's a number of people that they don't like their fans. They don't want their fans around. They want the money and they want them out. And <clears throat> uh, for the most part, the guys we use love their fans, love the fans. Um, but I've been around people that didn't want anyone. No, no pictures. Nobody, nobody gets to talk to me. No one gets to say hi to me. And I would say, when you become that important, you've sacrificed in your own life the part of this business that made it fun to do, right? So, I, I mean, I know when I go on stage, <clears throat> I know I'm going to be funny. I'm not worried about that part anymore. But I know that I still want to be funny. I still want the guy and girl in that seat to want to talk to me. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to not want that. Because once they want that, it's the greatest feeling in the world. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to go to the prom. And I was super shy around girls, super shy. And so as a junior, <clears throat> as a junior, I, I waited to the last minute and there's this girl, Margie Richard, beautiful girl. And nobody asked Margie to prom. I hope she's listening right now. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> let's find but, her. <laughs> uh, let's find her. But I asked Margie Richard to prom and she went with me. And Margie was prettier than I should have been going to the prom with. And the next year, I asked. Lisa, I rocked her to go to the prom. Another very pretty girl that everybody wanted to go to the prom with, and she didn't have a date. Now, I contend that these two women said, Christ Almighty, I got to go with this jackass because if I don't, I'm not going to the, to the goddamn prom. Now, once that happened, I, the, the number of people that said to me, well, I would have went with you. I would have went with you. And I remember thinking, well, I haven't had a date in high school in three years. I've been O for three years. And once you got that point, that, that feeling of other people wanting to be around you is special. You know, my wife and I, I married way above my station. So we have a saying, we're married. The ring doesn't keep us here. The ring is just a nice thing, right? I wear my ring, Chrissy. So that women like yourself know to stay away, right? <laughs> so, but my wife said this one time, and I think some men would have been mad, but I was so flattered. She said, 
that ring doesn't mean anything. I choose to stay with you every day. And I'm like, that's the greatest. That's nice. Yeah. Right. And so now that's how we say it. We say we choose our relationship every day. As a comic. So true. Yeah. And as a comic, when you see people become, I'm going to walk through the room and no one's going to get to look at me and no one's going to get to take a picture and I'm going to do my job and you're going to clap dutifully and don't you dare disagree with me. And I'm going to storm off. Yeah, what are you, Ellen? Come on. It's like well, <laughs> you've lost that magic for yourself. Mm -hmm. Now the magic only works if they're kissing your ass. And if you only allow the ass kissers in your audience, you're not going to remain sharp. You're not. Mm -hmm. You're not going to remain that thing. You know, I, I work tonight. In front of Jeff Dye's crowd. Jeff Dye's one of my favorite comics. Oh, he, another really nice guy. Super nice guy. Super funny. He's my man crush. And um, <laughs> yeah, he's not bad to look at. <laughs> oh, he's a great guy. Great looking guy too. And you know, I, I get laughs in front of his crowd because I go up and I want it, right? Because you know, now they shouldn't laugh at me. I'm at least one year older than Jeff. <laughs> and <laughs> so you know, I, I think you have to love that. I watch Jim Brewer work. Oh my God. Brewer, Bob Marley. Oh, so funny. These guys love their audience. Yeah. They uh, they're so like in the present moment, it makes you just like fall in love with comedy like all over again. Like I just one time saw Jim do a set. God, I think it was like Levity Live. I don't think he said a single joke. Like it just was like a conversation. It was so funny. I think he was just talking about the Mets the whole time. It was so He's fucking funny. But watching Brian Regan work. Brian Regan loves doing what he does. John Legazama, Brian Regan, uh, Bob Marley, brilliantly funny. Jim Brewer, one of my favorites, brilliantly funny. Uh, you know, then you, then you see some people. Uh, I I don't know. I I I I hope. I become famous and I hope that I can still maintain that actual love and appreciation you feel when you get them. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to become yeah. famous. Oh, stop. Go on. No, you're going to become famous. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Try and remember this. Try and remember when you went up on stage and you weren't a hundred percent sure of yourself to remember what it felt like when you got them. There's no I'll better feeling. It's like no. crack. I haven't tried crack, but I imagine it's like crack. It's like, pff, it just makes up for everything in that moment. You like, you feel seen, especially if it's like uh, an, a joke that reveals some sort of honesty about yourself. It's the best. And, there's so many layers to it. You can help a room full of people kind of like unite together in the same moment. Maybe it helps them forget about their problems. Maybe they think less harshly about themselves. There's like so many things that's good about it. When someone tells me that they needed what I did on that night, whether it was producing a show or performing, when someone comes up and shakes my hand and says, I needed that tonight, I will tell you that every single time, I have to fight crime every time. I've oh. never not had to fight back that overwhelming feeling of just wanting to cry and appreciate that you're appreciated. And it happens, listen, it happens enough. It happens enough in my life. We do a lot of work for a lot of organizations and, uh, and then, you know, you do a lot of shows. And when someone says, I needed that. I had a woman in the audience one time. And, uh, I, man, I was a young comic. And I was working at a club off of the Sawmill River Parkway for Dan Rosenthal. There's a table. I could see them. I could see them. They're sitting to my stage right. There's 12 of them. Six couples. And I'm a young comic, so I'm doing a lot of crowd. And I'm talking... And I, uh, you're all husband and wife. And the one woman goes, well, he's not my husband. So I go, oh, I go, who's that? And she goes, 
I said, are you married? And she goes, yes. And I go, well, who is that? And she goes, well, I'm out with him tonight. And I, you know, I may have said something like, oh, dirty girl, whatever. And I said, well, who is that? Oh, no. And then she said, my husband passed away. <laughs> and I go, when did your husband pass away? And she said, a couple months ago. And I, I made a joke. <laughs> I made a little joke about her rushing it. And I said, well, who is this guy? How'd you meet him? And she said, that's my husband's heart surgeon. Oh, my God. That's now, so good. <laughs> I, I go, I go, <laughs> did, was he getting oh heart God. surgery when he died? And she said, yes, he was. And the whole room <gasps> is dead quiet. It's you're like, what? Most- you're like, ma'am, what did you wear to the heart surgery? Oh, <laughs> was it a tight dress? <laughs> oh, I got to tell you, it was so. Oh, that's dead. the most perfect moment. But was she going to kill you? (laughs) Well, I said, I looked at the surgeon and I said, that's how you made it up to her? Hey, I know I killed your husband. Let's go to a comedy show. Well, the room left. Hard. Oh, man. She came up to me after the show. And I went to shake her hand. She pushed my hand away and she gave me a big hug. Whoa. I thought she was going to bitch slap you. No. She gave me a big hug and she kissed me on the cheek. And she said... You're next. No. <laughs> no, she, <laughs> no, she said, I have not laughed since before my husband's surgery. Wow. And I appreciate what you did tonight. And I tell you something, I still get choked up telling the story. Mm-hmm. So that moment, man, that's that's why we do what we do, right? That moment or or you know, whatever. There are good moments, bad moments, there's celebrations. I tell every one of my staff members, the people in the room. If you're in New York or Connecticut in particular, you're in the richest entertainment market in the world before COVID. <laughs> before COVID. There's Broadway plays, there's the Yankees, there's the Mets, the Giants, the Jets, the Rangers, the Devils, the Islanders, the Nets, the Knicks. There's professional soccer, and I list everything. And when they walk in the door of the stress factor, they're telling you, out of all of these options, they came here. Now, some are coming because they love it. Some are coming because they need it. Some are coming because they want it. But they're all coming here for a reason. And your job is to make that a reality. To get them there, yeah. Yep. The server, the comic, the person answering the phone, our job is very intense. And I tell people, you can't work with me if you don't buy into the notion that this is not just a comedy show. If you're a server and you're just serving drinks, I will get rid of you. Mm. If you're a comic that doesn't give a shit, I won't use you. If you're a phone person that goes, stress factory, I just won't have you because Hmm. we're doing something that I am very, very uh, intense about doing. It's that's what I love to do. Was this supposed to be a funny podcast? You know, (laughs) we 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 had fun. We laughed. We had some lols. No, No, this is good. I should have asked you because here's the other thing: you don't know me from Adam. It's our first protracted conversation. It's our first convo, yeah. And I also feel like I'm talking too much. No, you're talking just the right amount because <laughs> these people hear me talk every day and we're here to learn about you. And it's like, I you, you're saying something that I wish I heard more comedians and more comedy club bookers like say out loud on the record. Cause it's like, that's the thing. When someone buys a comedy club, uh, a comedy show ticket, they that's like they want to have a good time and it's like some they'll buy tickets but they'll still come there they just can't get there it's like sometimes it's emotional sometimes it's physical it's like they want to have a good time and i have to remember that too like i tell myself like some combination of like they love you they're here because they want to have a good time you just have to get them there some kind of combination of like 
you know, if the, if you meet a tough cookie, it's it's my job to charm the pants off them and have them leave in a better mood than they came in. And uh, like, yes, there's so there's such a part of doing comedy that's ego that it's like you it feels good to get a laugh. You feel good about yourself. You feel like powerful sometimes, validated. But there's also this like very like um, selfless like giving aspect of comedy too, which is exactly what you're saying. Like g like giving people something that you that. I mean, yes, money can buy it, but like to give someone a feeling is so valuable to like uplift their spirits. And uh, it's kind of like let them know that it's going to be okay. Like, yeah, your husband just died, but you were able to come in and laugh tonight. So that's pretty cool. It's like you, you know, can't. You know, uh, I tell young comics, and uh, you'll see them getting ready and they're nervous. And you'll hear them say, I just got to get him. And, but I think it's probably closer to true that you had them when they bought the ticket. People don't buy a ticket to Yankee Stadium and go, I hope they lose tonight. And they don't buy a ticket for a comedy show and go, I hope Vinnie Brand stinks. Now, there are people that go to comedy clubs with chips on their shoulder. Maybe something happened in the car ride over them and him and their wife or her and her husband got in a fight. Uh, maybe they're just assholes. Uh, of course that happens, but the average customer is there fully ready for you to be good. And, you know, someone, every now and again, someone will say, well, what are you doing when a joke doesn't work? You know, now when you're young and a joke doesn't work, you scramble to the next joke and you, you, you say something right away. You got to right away try and get that next laugh. And I don't know, years ago I started saying, if a joke doesn't work, it great, please doesn't happen that often. But when it does, I'll go, yeah, I just, right to the audience, I'll say, I just can't even understand how that could be so funny in my head and just <laughs> not get anyone to laugh. And then that moment of very real reflection almost always gets a laugh. That's your, and that became a mechanism, right? So, the same way with a heckler, you know, you want to have a heckler in line. And one day, I, again, I don't get heckled off. It was this guy in the room, and I'm really having a great show. And I, I have a very odd memory. I could see him. I know right where he was. And I'm having a great show. Everyone's having a good time. And there's a lull, and he said something. And it was a slam. I forget what he said. And nobody laughed at what he said. It just stopped the show. And I go, man, I go, uh, you're not having a good time? He goes, no, I'm not. I go, man, I, go, I feel really bad for you. I'm right. I feel really bad. And the audience is like squirmed a little bit. Because here I am saying, I'm, you know, and I go, when I mean, you're sitting there 40 minutes into my set, not enjoying me, and you had 40 minutes, and you've been sitting there saying to yourself, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. It's going to be great. And in 40 minutes, that's all you can put together with that comment. Hmm. Like, I feel really bad that you don't have a better process. And the audience now knows that I'm dissing him in a empathetic way that's very real, but very, uh, very rude to him. But I'm being so proud. I'm going, I feel bad. You're just, you're not funny at all. And you thought that's you had the best you can do. <laughs> right. And that's what I said in a very complex way. And it murdered. And from that point forward, I've never been afraid. And again, it doesn't happen often, but that's kind of what you say. Now, if someone gets me, if someone gets me, I'll just go, man, that's funny shit right there. Like, that's really, what well, you just said made me laugh. Big ups. And then they're on your side. They're not mad anymore. They're like, I got big ups from this guy that I don't like. So, yeah. you know, I don't, we started on appreciating the audience and appreciating the moment. So many avenues, you know. Now we're like, fuck them. No, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's really good to, uh, just that what you said before, it's like the moment of acknowledging a joke that doesn't work, which happens rarely for me. No, it happens. <laughs> but like just the acknowledging, like, oh, I guess you don't like, and then whatever the topic is of the joke. 
and that's that's what reminds me that like comedy is sometimes more about connection than it is about getting a laugh because once you can say oh that joke didn't land you're immediately connecting with the audience they're like okay we're no longer separate like even if we didn't or some of us or most of us didn't laugh at that like you're with us you're present it's like a reset so it's so much fun now i gotta ask you a question you're coming to do the Vicky and Vinny show. Yes. Tell me how the Vicky and Vinny show came to be. Well, you know, uh, my wife's a writer, but not a comedy writer. And uh, I don't know how I, I, I got to ask her how the very first one came about. But um, we decided early on in March or April of 20, that things were shut down. People had nothing to laugh about a lot of followers on Facebook and I said let's just, let's just do a show at the club and we'll tell stories no audience we'll just tell stories and we put together some equipment went down to the club this is in the deep dark quarantine days no one's allowed in. oh yeah and we did shows we did a couple of shows with nobody there no one in the room first one was maybe March very early April and we did a couple uh, shows and we had a lot of people watch and so then we started doing it once a week and we called it Vicky and Vinny Live and then we invited a band down one day I said let's just showcase this band and we showcased the band and then we started asking more and more and more people started watching this damn show and it just evolved into something that at first we did for people to give them something to laugh about, to stay connected to our friends and our, our audience, give them something to laugh about for free. It's all for free. Mm -hmm. And it just evolved into this really good thing. And then we met this young musician, Joe Coonan. And Joe put a band together called the Hungry Hounds. And they're our house band now. They're there with us every week. And now we've had a show that everybody wants to do not everybody but enough people want to do it and we got a great live audience now we have an audience and you know we'll have 140 people in the room live and then the band and i gotta tell you chrissy it is the most gratifying and fun show we had tommy davidson this last week mm. tommy's messing with the band and i mean it's just a loose fun great night and that's kind of how it evolved. And we now we have a lot of followers and it just keeps growing. So we're excited uh, to keep it going no matter what happens. I think COVID is going to be around. We're going to be shut down another year. Oh, God. It's, it's, listen, it, it's going to be, fall would be miraculous. To be wow. open in fall would be miraculous. And people go, yeah, you're wrong. Listen, in the beginning of this thing, they said two weeks. We're flattening the curve in two weeks. It's we a are, long two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are six weeks away from the one year mark. Poof. Has it gotten better or worse? No, it hasn't gotten better at all. It's like they're, they're I don't know, it's bullshit. It's like whatever they want it to be. It's like they can fudge the numbers whenever they want. They can, I, 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 it's all over the place. It's all over the map. And so, so we're going to keep doing the show. We built this great outdoor area. My wife and I took a lot of chances when I opened the club. I didn't know Vicky yet. Um, but when I opened where we are right now, I lived in a boarding house. I was just divorced. I had no money, no car, no phone, no home. You're like a real comedian. Yeah. Yeah. I was like a real comedian. Even worse, because real comedians had friends and I had nothing. I, I divorced and got no. nothing. And so when this happened, my wife and I sat right at where I'm sitting right now. We have a little bar in our basement and uh, in my little man cave. And we're talking and we're both, what are we going to do? And I looked at her and said, hey, listen, we've been poor before. We'll figure it out. 
And that's what we've done. And it's so much fun. I love doing the show. You're going to love it. I thought you were about to say I love being poor. <laughs> like, <laughs> ramen! <laughs> well, you know, we're still poor. But now, what the pandemic did, it turned me from a full-blown aggressive capitalist into a full-blown where's my money socialist. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You're yeah. you're on the you're you skew right, am I, I right? No, I, I like I'm a, I'm still a registered Democrat. I um I did vote for Trump in the last election, but I don't know how much that's saying. I um I think free speech really activated me to start caring more about politics and and caring more about like constitutional rights. If that's if that's a I don't know. I've I've taken a test that said I'm libertarian. Um. So yeah, if I'm if I'm like right of center, yeah, okay, I guess I'll take that. I don't know, but I've been way on the left too, so I totally, I, I kind of understand people no matter where they fall. I am socially liberal, fiscally conservative. It's yeah. such a simple thing to me. With the public money, we should be careful. But I mean this with all my heart. If the house is clean and the groceries are put away, and the eggs are hot, women should be allowed to vote. And I mean that. <laughs> I mean that. The eggs are hot. I don't know where you're going with that. I was like, oh, he's about to make a statement about society. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, uh, listen, me, I, it's very simple. I don't give a shit who's sleeping with who. That's none of my business. Yeah, most people don't. It's like so not a thing most people think about, but they like, I feel like, it's shoved down our throats a lot. Well, the social the social place is difficult, right? So if I say, okay, I don't believe I believe someone should become be allowed to be what they want to be. So if you want to become transgender, become transgender. I say that. If I also say, gee, I don't know if it's right that a man that becomes a woman should be allowed to compete against natural born women in the Olympics. Well, the easiest way to shut me up is to call me transphobic. Yep. And I'm not transphobic. I believe that that is an inequity and I'm an equity guy, right? I mean, I believe in fair. So I'm deaf. I don't think that my being deaf should allow me to run against uh, mobility challenged individuals in the Special Olympics. I don't get to say, well, we're both, I don't even know if the word's right. I, Something, I got to yeah, we're both like. Handicapped, in... I'm not going to say that. Uh, we're both challenged. So <laughs> I'm special, you're special. It's a special Olympics. Let's do the 50 yard dash. Oh, Almost right. special. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, am I, am I handicap uh, insensitive? I'm handicapped for Christ's sake. I'm deaf. I wear two hearing aids. So we've got, we've got this world now where everything's a zero sum game. If you don't agree 100%, well, then you're this. And that's right. A, it's an arrogant and it's an ignorance and it's a control factor. And it's a poison. Just it like, really is. Right? I'm sorry. We're supposed to be funny. We're so, let's be funny. No. <laughs> we were funny. This is this has been funny. People I don't know. Been... You know, I'm nervous. I'm nervous that I'm... I've never listened to myself on a podcast and been happy. <laughs> you're No, you're doing great. I want to know... So we've talked about what makes a headliner difficult to deal with. What... And I, you know, maybe you have talked about this because you've mentioned the comics that you really love and enjoy. What makes a headlining comic like a pleasure to deal with at your clubs? Oh man, I mean, you know, when a, when a comic comes in and goes, okay, I want to do fifty five minutes. I, I'm gonna do my job. Hey, can I go later on the long show, uh, longer on the late show? You know, someone that, you know, just today, Jeff and I got to the hotel and the hotel room wasn't ready. He called me and said, hey, it's Jeff, um, I'm at the hotel that I have a reservation. Oh, Christ. I, I make the phone calls. 
I call him back five minutes later. I go, Jeff, I'm going to check in right now. He goes, hey, Vinny, no big deal. I, I went to Starbucks. I'm getting a coffee. I'll go back in a few minutes. He, right? Now, that makes Jeff, it's one of the many aspects, right? Brett Ernst stays till three in the morning. George Lopez stays till eight in the morning. Oh, um, wow. Brian Regan is just the warmest, friendliest. I want everyone on the show to do well. Brewer, uh, Marty. When, when guys come in and they love what they do and they get it, they get every aspect of it. They know on the early show, I got to flip the room and make the room ready for the night show. Um, you know, that's what makes them. And when they connect, when they, the, guy, the guys and girls that still want to connect. I'll know when I watch you on stage. No pressure. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> hey. I will know when I watch you if you are – I have a very accurate gauge. When I watch someone on stage, I can look at them and say, this person will become an asshole or not. <laughs> it's, I, and I'm almost 100%, 100% right. I have almost never been wrong. I, I knew Ray Romano was going to be a star. And I knew he'd be a nice guy forever. Kevin James, star, nice guy forever. I just knew it. Um, I didn't know Damon before I met him. But as soon as I met him, inside seconds, you know, this guy, this guy is through young Damon Wayans, who's a scion of a major entertainment family. And he comes in like Jeff. Grateful Tony Rock. Tony Rock. A mur- have you worked with Tony Rock? Uh, that's Chris Rock's brother, right? Yes. Yes, I have. Yeah, he's super funny. A super funny guy. And a genuinely great guy. Um, Chris Rock. Uh, so these guys come in and, and, and they're grateful. I'll tell you one of the greatest guys, one of the greatest stories. John Leguizamo came in to run one of his shows. And Chrissy, I'm telling you right now, I had not met the man before, and I watched him set up. I said to myself, oh, boy, this get the free tickets ready. <laughs> get them <laughs> ready. Because he goes up on stage. He goes, I need a podium. I put a podium up there. I go, what are you going to do with the podium? Well, because <laughs> I'm going to read my act. I go, what are you going to do? Because I don't have it committed yet to memory. I'm going to read it. I walked in the back and said to Mark McCoy, my manager, I said, Mark, you better get 340 free tickets ready. <laughs> this son of a bitch is going to read the act. Oh, He's no. going to read it. Uh, who could do it? And John Leguizamo walks up on stage, and he opens the laptop, and he delivers his – because his is a performance piece. And he's written the piece. And he murdered. Wow. Dude. And it got better. He did it a bunch of times. And he changed things. He went back and changed things. But murdered. Uh, you know, just consummate pro. Watching yeah. uh, Chris Rock take a two and a half hour set, widow it down to one hour over 18 shows, and then go record it. Lopez, same thing. Um, came in and uh, was running his show that he did live on HBO beforehand. And nobody in this business can drink with George Lopez. <laughs> Why? Nobody. How, many drinks, how many drinks does he have? Huh? How many drinks does he have usually? Listen, he's a great guy. He does not drink before the show. Okay. After the show in the green room from 1 a.m. to 7.30 in the morning. Oh, man. A bottle of tequila and 13 Coronas. No. Yeah. No way. Yeah. There's no way. Oh, yeah. And sober. By and himself. It- and then all of a sudden he gets. Then all of a sudden he's a little, ah, you know, drunk. But Ooh, I would tell you, the so one he's... we just done, seven thirty. I take a picture in front of the club. I'm driving home. My wife calls. She goes, "Where the hell are you?" I go, "I'm driving home. I just, I just left the club." And she goes, "You just locked up the club?" I go, "Oh no, no, they're still there. I quit." I, I, no. They were there. They no. Were there. Who was there with him? Who was still there? And the managers, the servers. This guy is so genuine and so down to earth and loves what he's doing. Everybody that wants to hang can hang. He's a major ball buster. He's a That's great cool. ball buster. And 
you know, you're on staff, you're golden. He treats the servers like he treats everybody. I saw him, he invited us down to um, the Kennedy Center for the live taping. Whether you were an usher or Nick Nusiforo, his agent, who was the head of touring for CAA, uh, for UTA, a very important guy, uh, his agents, his, his managers, me, the, the usher, the customer, all treated the same way. Like wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's Great amazing. Guy. Great guy. And he can out drink everybody. Uh, can, uh, tell me. Well, his opening act, uh, Brian, oh, God damn it, went drink for drink with him. Drink for <laughs> drink. And they called me a puta the whole night. Wow. Because I'm drinking coffee. Wow. Like, that's, that's bitch in Spanish. <laughs> yes. They called me a puta. You were a puta. Night. Look at you, puta, with your coffee. I'm like, I, my heart should be ripping out of my, I so much coffee. Uh, oh my, wait, night. wait, wait. Would he do? Would he drink that much and then do a second show? What's that? Would he drink that much and then do a second show? Or no, would this no, no, be no. Oh, no drinks until the shows are in the can? Wow. Very that's pro. That's a professional. <laughs> very pro. Very, very pro. Really great guy. Great writer. Great human being. Just a really great human being. I mean, I'll tell you another guy. Uh, you ever work with Craig Robinson? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know who he is. You ever work with him? Um, I don't think we've ever been on the same show. But I've if seen I'm boring you, you can end this. No, night. not at all. I'm not bored. Okay, am I boring you? Definitely don't not. Me. I'm, I'm not bored. I'm not bored. <laughs> uh, Craig Robinson, another all night hangout. But after the show, gets up on the keyboard and says a whole second show. I'll tell you a very fun story. He had done the show, and uh, I wanted to sing something. And so it's like 2 in the morning, <laughs> and I get him back up on the keyboard, and he starts messing around with the keyboard. And now him and I are on stage, and we're just fucking around. The staff's just cleaning up. And <clears throat> one staff member calls her boyfriend and says, come on down here. Craig's on stage. You got to see this. And then another, and then another. And in about 40 minutes, from 2.15 to 3.15, the, the club filled up about 60 people. Oh, my God. This is just all friends of the work, of, like, people who work there? Friends of friends and friends. All kind of, can I come in? And he stayed on stage till about 5 a.m. Oh and God. we had the greatest time. The greatest time. Um, then around five thirty, six o'clock in the morning, a limousine pulls up. He calls the limousine. My son is there and he goes, Hey man, get in the car. Let's go to the city and have some fun. And I watch my son. He's an adult, but yeah, he's still my boy. And I'm like, what are you doing? And it, off they go. And they drove in the city. And I saw him two days later. Oh my God. <laughs> I never, I never got the story. Of what and they I, did? As a father, I didn't want it. <laughs> oh, my God. See, that for me, I i don't know how you could stay up that late. I don't know. I would need a lot of coffees. Oh, we've had some, some really great late night hangs. Um, you know, and some great. That's great. Yeah. What do you think? Can you think of like a time where like worst audience scenario or like worst thing audience members ever done? Um you know, that resulted in them getting bounced out. Like, can you think of like craziest thing you've ever seen an audience member do? All right. So we did a show for the Robert Wood Johnson Medical Hospital. This is um, 220 uh, second or third year medical students. And they're going to come in for a comedy show two or three days after they cut open their first cadaver. Do So... They come in. I'm dating Vicky. We're not married yet. The green room at the uh, soundboard is where the green room is now, way back by the bathroom. And I'm in the soundboard and I see my now wife walk into the ladies' room. And I'm just, I'm not looking, but I see a guy walk into the ladies' room. And in my head, I go, Did a guy just walk in the ladies' room? 
And then I hear my wife, my girlfriend scream. And I, I run to the ladies room and there's a guy standing with a stall door open. And I can clearly see that Vicky is sitting on the toilet covering herself going, get out of here. And the guy's going, no, you don't understand. It's okay. Well, Oof. <laughs> I grab the guy and I'm not tough, but I slam him in the wall. I grab him by the short car and I bounce him off every wall of that club. <laughs> what, year was this? what year was this? Do you remember? Uh, well, we're married in 98. This is 97. Okay, so this is before and, like woke bathroom times. Yes, and I'm I, I Chris, I off of every surface. Watch out for that, and I'm slamming them, and I'm I'm really I'm hurting them without hurting them. Wow! And I get him to the front door, and I kick the front door open, and I throw him out. Now was he I, just trying to be a creep, or was he actually trying to like physically get to him? Oh, I'm gonna tell you the whole. So now these two girls come out and go, "What did you just do? You just threw, you know." Hector out or whatever his name was. <laughs> and I go, well, he was just in the bathroom and he opened the stall on my wife and my girlfriend. And the girl goes, it doesn't matter. I go, yeah, it does matter. She's going to the bathroom. He's a guy in the girl in the ladies room. And then he's out there and he's all, he's like, he's got caught because he's all banged up. And he goes, I tried to tell you, it doesn't matter because I'm gay. And I go, I don't give a fuck. You can't go in the ladies' room. <laughs> now I turn around and the girls go, oh, and they go inside and they go, everybody, the owner just beat up Hector. And 230 people stood up and stormed out of the club at one time. Oh my God. And then we didn't do the party again. That party had been an every year party. We didn't do it again until a couple years ago. And, uh, you know, just a silly, funny thing. Um, but that's the worst time that we've ever had an audience do anything. Wouldn't uh, it be so funny if <laughs> if it turned out that your that your wife that your girlfriend now wife was actually in the men's room? <laughs> like oh, she that was, would be, yeah. who fucked yeah. up? You'd be like, Oops, yeah, my sorry. bad. Well, you know, I'm not a tough guy, and but in a moment, you know, you got to be uh, ready for anything, you know, and uh, you know, we've had. A couple fights, not many. Uh, it's been a pretty good run. It's been a pretty safe, good run. But that one made me laugh because you're asking about an audience getting unruly. And they all just, oh, oh, I'll tell you a very fun part of the story. There were two people that were not part of Robert Wood Johnson that night. And when everybody left, they stayed. The only two people in the room. And I walk up like, hey, guys, uh, the show's canceled. And... The guy goes, why? I go, because everybody left. You're the only two people here. And he goes, well, I didn't come for them. I came for comedy. <laughs> and we did the show for two people. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Fun, fun night. So, yeah. yeah. They got a personal set. That's good. Every comic has to do at least one show where it's like two people, five people. Like that's, you learn some things. Did you ever do late night at the comic strip? Yes. Oh, yeah. For like a while. And so, then, uh, yeah. Was Lucian alive or no? No, it was like way after his time. Yeah. It was so, like long you know, Lucian's died. late night started at 11. And yeah, get in there at 8, 8, 8 p.m. to sign up. And I signed up one night. I'm like third on late night, fourth on late night. And uh, your fans should know, late night is you go and you sign up early. And then you watch the best comics in New York City work from 8 to 11, 11, 15. And then the MC goes, hey. That's our show for tonight, but there's nine more comics. They're going to do three minutes each, and they're all new. And at this point, it's the same audience for three hours, right, Chrissy? Yeah. So I get late night one night, and uh, they introduced me. And the guy right before me comes off. He goes, Pah. it's only three people in there, and one's asleep. Hmm. So I walk in the room. You got to get introduced. And there were two girls on the front table and a guy, the guy's in the back. He's fully asleep, head on the table. <laughs> and the two girls are lesbians and they're making out. So I do my first joke, they don't stop kissing. Second, they don't stop kissing. <laughs> so I said, well, screw it, I'm going to watch. So I'm watching. <laughs> I stopped talking. And I'm just watching these two girls make out. 
and they're making out. And it got so quiet that the drunk heard the quiet. He pops his head off the table and he goes, why is it so quiet in here? <laughs> and oh, my off. God. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. That's great. I hope this is good. Who did you have last week in your podcast? Who did I have last? Yeah. Before you, it was Megan Murphy. She's a Canadian writer. I didn't uh, she, uh, what? Morgan Murphy. Um, no, she's not a comedian. Her name is Megan Murphy. She's a Canadian writer. Oh, okay. So I'll have like comedians on. I'll have like political personalities on. Sometimes a porn star. Like I had Michaela Peterson on once. Probably biggest guest so far is like Roger Stone, Gavin McGinnis, Ann Coulter. Those are probably like the most exciting. Bigger I guests. think that. Uh, and now you. Yeah. And now me. So you're the high water mark. Well, I don't know if anyone finds me interesting. I know. Yes, I do. Um, where can people find you? But of course, like I said in the opening, I'm going to be uh, at the Stress Factory in New Brunswick on February 28th. So check that out. Buy tickets now. Go to the Stress Factory website. Buy your tickets. And I think people can watch the live stream as well if they are not wanting to leave their homes. Um, Vinny, where else can people find you, follow you, support you? Well, you know, for me, they go to Twitter at Vinny underscore brand. And then uh, Facebook is Vinny Brand Comedian. And Instagram is Vinny uh, underscore brand. And that's where, you know, our show airs on our Stress Factory Facebook page. And YouTube is Vinny Brand or Stress Factory, either way it gets you there. And we are uh, really having a blast. So if you follow us, I would be so happy and so grateful. And I'm going to tell you something that people do not understand. I was the first entertainer to do this in all of the industry. And I'm the only one giving out my actual real phone number. A lot of guys now, they give out a number and you call and you get, hey, this is Matt Damon. Thanks for calling. Uh, <laughs> you know, follow me on Instagram and, you know, leave a message. And then, you know, one of Matt's 87 personal assistants We'll listen to your message and go, Matt, another asshole called, um, if they even see him. But, Chrissy, I give away my actual number out. And wow. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Because if somebody listening to your podcast needs something, they should be able to go, hey, I want to get a hold of any. And they can do that by calling 908-601-6976. Chrissy, is that my real number? Let's check. I mean, I can't believe you are possibly about to give out your real number. I just did Let's see. Um, yes, it is. Jesus. 908-601-6976. And I, you know, I hear the thing. People say, well, what if somebody called? Send him dick pics, everybody. You heard him. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care. Now, I'm going to do something uh, that I've never done. And this is a unique thing. I'm going to give out Chrissy's number, but not in the order. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the order. Oh, I'm going to just give out the digits, and then people can start playing with it. And there wow. might be a million combinations. But Chrissy's number includes the following digits. Six, zero, five, nine, two, two, zero, seven, one, six, five, one. If you can figure it out, you can call Chrissy Mayer directly. Now, me... I'm not I'm not smart box like Chrissy. I'll give you my actual number. 908 601 6976. Why don't you sweeten the deal? Why don't you give out your social security number while you're at it? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. No. Um, Vinny, thank you so much for coming on. I am so looking forward to performing at your club next month. Uh, it's gonna be great. I feel like this was a fantastic episode. You really gave everybody a great like inside look at not only the stand-up comedy world, but also the producing side of things. So um, yes, looking forward to having you on back someday, and I will see you next month. Chrissy, thank you. And can I say one other thing? If you are listening and you're still listening, thank you. Go, our podcast also airs on our Facebook page. So we'll have Chrissy on someday because we do some fun stuff there too. And I'll, I'll turn the table and interview you. Oh, okay. All right, good deal, Chrissy. Thank you so much. And then I'll give out your phone number scrambled. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Vinny. Bye.